Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and welcome to all of our EWTN viewers here on Living Divine Mercy. You know, along with St. Faustina and John Paul II, Francesco Forgione is often called one of the greatest saints of our modern times. And with his feast day coming up this Friday, September 23rd, we thought it was a great time to talk about this amazing saint, also known as Padre Pio. Padre Pio was born in Italy uh, to peasant farmers back in 1887 and lived a good life. He died on September 23rd, 1968. His parents were illiterate, as many were, but they were very holy. They went to daily mass and even memorized the scriptures. Wow. When Francesco was only five, his mother said he could see and speak to Jesus, Mary, and his guardian angel. God gave him a lot of spiritual gifts, like healing, bilocation, levitation, prophecy, miracles, living long periods of time only on the Eucharist, and most people remember the ability to read souls. You know, he was ordained in 1910, and soon afterwards he received the stigmata. Now that is where a person will bear the wounds of Christ, where he had the wounds and actual blood will come. It, um, it's where we, in your own flesh, bear the wounds of the crucifixion. Now, they would remain with him for over 50 years. So after he was ordained, then uh, in 1916, he entered the Franciscan friary of San Giovanni Rotondo. Um, now, the first thing we should say is friars are different from monks. We kind of confuse those, but uh, they're different. <clears throat> and that they are called to live in service out in society, the friars are, rather um, than being in a cloistered life, like in a monastery, like a monk would be. So while monks and nuns live inside a cloistered community, friars and sisters work amongst the lay people out in the world, like teaching and, and great vocations like that. So it is more likely um, when you were young that you were taught by sisters rather than nuns. Although my father and everybody always says the nuns. Now, when Padre Pio died, uh, the stigmata had completely disappeared without a scar. He was flawless and his body was found empty of all blood. You know, it's reported that 80% of all stigmatists are women, but St. Francis and maybe even St. Paul were the first to receive it, and Padre Pio was the most well-known to receive it. So it's both men and women. Now, each day, Padre Pio would lose up to a cup of blood, but the wounds never closed and never festered. Um, also, a sweet odor emanated from them instead of your normal expected smell of blood. Now, one day, he was asked by John Paul II, who was at the time a cardinal, which wound caused him the most pain? Now, surprisingly, he said it was the wound on his shoulder. Now, when you think about it, though, that's not really shouldn't be too surprising because Jesus also told St. Bernard of Clairvaux that of all the wounds that he incurred during his passion, the worst, by far, Jesus said, was on his shoulder. And this wound isn't even recorded in the Bible. You know, Jesus said that the wood, and actually it was his right shoulder, uh, the wood tore his flesh down to the bone. And uh, there's a prayer. You know, the prayer to the shoulder wound of Christ is powerful because Jesus promises to all those who pray it and who venerate this wound, he will remit all of their venial sins and no longer remember their mortal sins. So great gift in, uh, in that devotion. So pray this prayer every day if you can. Now back to Padre Pio. He's also known for amazing miracles. You know, one woman who was born without pupils in her eyes came to Padre Pio after mass one day. And like Jesus, 
Padre Pio rubbed her eyes. This woman named Gemma Di Giorgi regained her sight and is still alive today. But here is the amazing thing. While it is quite miraculous, it's true that she regained her sight and can now see. It's a miracle in itself. But what is even more startling is that she still doesn't have any pupils. How can you see without any pupils in your eyes? So God can do some incredible things through his saints if we simply have faith. You know, in another story, do you remember C. Everett Koop, the former U.S. Surgeon General under President Reagan in the 1980s? Well, back in 1966, he was a doctor in the case of little Vera Marie Calandra. She was born with a congenital kidney condition, and after several surgeries, Dr. Koop had to remove her bladder and told the little girl's parents, unfortunately, that she would undoubtedly die very soon. Strong in their faith, however, her mother, having heard of Padre Pio and his healing miracles, took the girl to San Giovanni Rotundo, where they met this priest, Padre Pio. He blessed her and placed his hands with the stigmatas on the little girl. When they returned home, to Dr. Koop's shocking amazement, he discovered that inside the child was growing a new bladder to replace the old one. Now that does not happen. This is unexplainable in the medical world. And she was completely recovered. Today, Vera and her family run the Padre Pio Shrine in Bardo, Pennsylvania, uh, a place where I have spoken and would definitely recommend you to try to visit someday. And then finally, there is my personal favorite miracle of any saint, the one that we call the flying monk. You know, I guess we should say the flying friar, right? After what we just said. Now in World War II, um, many pilots in Italy testified to an amazing occurrence. While flying their military missions, each time they approached the area of San Giovanni Rotundo, they saw in the sky a friar who, stretching out his wounded hands, prevented them from dropping their bombs. Now, this event was directly witnessed by the general of the Italian Air Force, Bernardo Rossini. And he said, quote, each time that the pilots returned from their missions, they spoke of this friar that appeared in the sky and diverted their airplanes, making them turn back, end quote. Now, while everyone was laughing, the stories kept recurring. Frustrated, the commanding general decided to take command of a squadron of bombers himself to destroy a cache of German war materials that was said to be right inside San Giovanni Rotondo. They knew that this arsenal existed, but they didn't know the exact precise location. Therefore, not to make any mistakes, they would have to bomb the entire town. Now, up until that time, no one had ever succeeded in going in that direction because of the flying monk or friar. Now, although they pushed the buttons numerous times, their bombs would not drop. And at the base, when they landed, the mechanics would look at it and they checked the bomb mechanisms and everything was in order perfectly. Nothing was unusual. The American general then got involved and he was quite upset as the Italian general recounted that as soon as they arrived near the target, they saw the figure of a monk floating in the sky with his hands held high. C could you imagine these generals having this conversation? <laughs> So this time, the bombs, he said, they dropped all by themselves, but they fell far off into the woods safely. Uh, nothing was harmed, and the planes turned around by themselves and went back to base. Sounds unbelievable, right? Well, later, somebody told the commanding general that at San Giovanni, there lived a priest that had the stigmata, whom everyone considered a saint, and that perhaps... He was the one responsible. So amazingly, after the war ended, the general, accompanied by a few pilots, went to the Capuchin convent. And there he saw a number of friars 
and recognized immediately the one who had stopped his airplanes. Padre Pio was that one, and he put a hand on his shoulder and said, so it is you, the one who wished to do away with all of us. Now, the general, uh, astonished at seeing and hearing this friar, this general knelt before him and praised God, and the two became good friends. And the general, who was a Protestant, converted to Catholicism. Wow, one of my favorite stories. You know, as with any saint, Padre Pio was a man of holiness and extreme virtue. Thus, a great example for us to follow. He survived on only three and a half ounces of food a day which isn't enough for an infant, actually, and yet he weighed more than 170 pounds. And his fellow friars often heard the sounds of the devil's attacks on him coming from his cell at night. And the bruises, um, they would be evident on his body in the morning, but he never despaired. He fought the devil by humility and obedience. So when times get tough, do what Padre Pio said, pray, hope, and don't worry. Now, that's a good key for a lifestyle that's a little bit, makes you be at peace, right? Now, our next guest is somebody that deals with a lifestyle that you think would bring a lot of peace, but there's a lot of challenges as a priest. This is a story of Father Frank Kankra, who actually his ministry is involved with those in the circus. This is Frank Kankra, the year 1971. Using your skill, your gift, your talent, what you're really revealing to the people that you perform for is, is the face of God. That, and that... this is Father Frank Cancro, present day. He's the national circus priest, and his flock, ever on the move, stretches from coast to coast. For of the more than 300,000 circus workers in the U.S., some 50% are Catholic. And this ministry is an answer to a cryptic remark Father Frank once heard from a circus-going spectator after he had introduced himself to her. And, and so I told her what I did, and then she said this to me, why do people like this need someone like that? But the answer should not surprise you. They're religious and spiritual people. They're grounded in this notion of something bigger than themselves, which always gives us something to be able to kind of uh, uh, work off of. The circus people are very religious. You know, before you go in to do, do your act, before you prepare yourself, you also, you also, we always pray, you know, we do the cross and we do have a connection, you know, before we go in. We have a little moment to connect with God right there. And it, it, it helps us tremendously. Father Frank was drawn to clowning from his childhood because it had lots of personal interaction laced with humor. But he decided he wasn't very good at it. He left it to join social workers at a Catholic mission in Eastern Kentucky's Appalachian region, something he was very good at. There, he met Sister John Martin of the Sisters of Divine Providence. And she would point a crooked finger at me, she was in her 80s I think at the time, and she'd say, how come you're not a priest? And spending time trying to come up with an answer for her, uh, I had to admit to myself that I think this might be what I really have an interest in doing. Father Frank eventually became a pastor in the Diocese of Charlotte. That's when Sister Dorothy Fabritz came to town to take up a collection for the circus and traveling show ministry. And she saw that photo. And once again, a sister pointed a finger. Who's that? And I had to admit to her, well, that's me. And then I had to tell her my story. And then she got angry at me for not being part of this ministry and said she was gonna do something about that. And that's how Father Frank joined a circus ministry that has existed in the Catholic Church for 125 years and has numbered among its most avid supporters both Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul. It's something that always amazes me that we are so appreciated on, on the shows and when they know we're coming, it's, it's, people are excited. It's an important keystone to to performers' lives. It's baptisms that happen, it's confirmations that happen, uh, it's weekly confessions or daily confessions, uh, it is mass uh, held uh, on a regular basis. Many of us had the, 
um, they've been married in the circus, so the priest would come and marry them in the, in the circus ring. There are always annual blessings of the animals that are going on the road or the equipment that's going on the road. And generally, whenever a season opens, we bless the tent. These ritual actions that are really part of making sure we know who we are in relationship to who God is with us as we travel down the road. We are like a little city traveling, so it's very important to bring the church into the circus because we don't have time to go. You're not uh, from the town, you're not from here. Many people don't speak language, you know, the language so good, so many people don't have a car to get around. So it was important to, to bring the church to the buildings or to the circus. It's the kind of faith life anybody would have. It just looks different because it might have an elephant in the background. And it's a difference that is only intensified by life on the road. If you have a problem that you can't solve in 48 hours, you're in a different locale 48 hours later. Because of the lifestyle on the road, uh, they're maybe more vulnerable, or at least their vulnerability shows more than it might with other uh, people. I think there's still this innate mis mistrust uh, in many places of people who are disconnected, who travel down the road, who live in trailers, who, and I think that gets communicated sometimes to uh, circus people. It's it's comforting, of course, of course. Um, you 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 have so many things happening. You want to talk to to the priest, you know. You want to do your you know have that little moment with him and kind of um, refresh and restart, you know. Have have that talk, uh, help you with problems, you know, to make you better, to make you better. But also the performance issues, you know, when when a ringmaster says that this is a death-defying act. He's not kidding. When you know what a circus is and what circus people go through, well, it allows your preaching then to be far more effective. To stay connected, Father Frank turned to weekly sermons on Twitter and has gained a reputation for delivering the shortest homily on record. It was an Ash Wednesday sermon, and, it, and the entire sermon uh, was wounds to scars. It's all part of Father Frank's unique style, one that finds its roots in his circus past even in his home diocese, where Christmas time finds three very unusual wise men, two life-size puppets with Father Frank in the middle. I have a background in props and in, in, in this kind of performance, and it makes sense to me that if you're gonna communicate the word, you communicate the word with the skills and the gifts that you've been given to do it with. Once a performer, always a performer. Home for the circus ministry is the National Circus Church, St. Martha's in Sarasota, Florida, once the winter home of Ringling Brothers. And it was Ringling that raised the funds to build it. And if you walk into St. Martha's and look at the altar area, you'll see on either side of the main altar, there are two large wagon wheels that have been uh, put into the decor. There's probably not another stole in the nation that's got elephant feet at the bottom of it and clown print elements of, on it and pieces of uh, circus wardrobe from different performers. That stole belonged to Father Frank's predecessor, the late Father Jerry Hogan, and no tale of the circus ministry would be complete without including him. For 28 years, he embraced the culture fully, once bringing a high wire rig into a church to illustrate the concept of trust in one of his sermons. In his attempts to master the circus's bilingual culture with his thick Boston accent, brings smiles to this day. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend on you, on your performance, on those you work with, on your animals, and keep you in peace forever. Amen. And still, there remains an unbridled optimism for this ministry by a man who found his calling and of a church that ran off to join the circus. Well, thank you, Father Frank, so much for bringing Christ to people and places that we normally don't associate as being religious. Now, let's go back to the scriptures and hear Deacon Tim read to us about how we must suffer with Christ if we are to be glorified with Christ. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 
I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The worst sufferings of this life last only a short time compared with the endless everlasting joys of heaven. As Isaiah promises, the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The depth and intensity of the joy we shall experience in the full embrace of our Lord, deep within his merciful heart, outweighs everything we may go through on earth. When St. Faustina is given knowledge of some of the severe mental sufferings of her spiritual director, Blessed Father Michael Shapochko, she reflects, The person who resembles the suffering Jesus here on earth will resemble Jesus in his glory. She observes, Truly, all these torments seem as nothing to me compared with the glory that is awaiting us for all eternity. Despite the grim realities of pain and death that St. Paul must have known very well, he promises that the divine glory we will receive in heaven will infinitely surpass such misery. In the depths of our hearts, do we believe this? Now let's hear from our saint expert and our former provincial superior, Father Dan Cambra, who I was under for many years and a beautiful experience, as he talks to us about St. Padre Pio. This is from the archives. Padre Pio was ordained a priest in August of 1910. But the thing that most people know him for is his stigmata, which he received on the 20th of September in 1918. It was shortly after he received the stigmata that people started flocking to see him. Literally, hundreds, even thousands, came to see him at his small friary in the small town of San Giovanni Rotondo. It was an unexpected reality. And while the church tried to treat this with the greatest degree of caution, the crowds kept coming. On one occasion, however, Padre Pio said that the crowds of holy souls from purgatory well outnumbered the living who came to see him. Each day of his life, crowds of holy souls came to him and asked for his prayers. In all of the history of the church, he is the first priest known to receive the stigmata the wounds of Christ in the hands, feet, and side. He actually bled his own blood, and it was a remarkable experience, clearly visible for everyone who came to see him. Once I was summoned to the judgment seat of God. I stood alone before the Lord. Jesus appeared, such as we know him during his passion. After a moment, his wounds disappeared, except for five, those in his hands, his feet, and his side. In the morning, I at once felt the torture of his five wounds in my body. This suffering continued until three o'clock. Although there is no outward sign of it, the torture is no less painful. I am glad that Jesus is protecting me from people's eyes. Jesus, from all my wounds, like from streams, mercy flows for souls. 
but the wound in my heart is the fountain of unfathomable mercy. From this fountain spring all graces for souls. The flames of compassion burn me. I desire greatly to pour them out upon souls. Speak to the whole world about my mercy. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this week's episode about Padre Pio. And join us next week because we're going to be talking about St. Therese. And actually, we're going to be entering into shortly the greatest single week, in my opinion, of the whole year of saints. On October 1st, we have the feast day of St. Therese. On October 2nd, we have the feast of the guardian angels. On October 4th, we have St. Francis of Assisi. October 5th, we have the big one in St. Faustina. And October 7th is the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. So this first week of October coming up is powerful. So we'll see you again next week as we talk about St. Therese. And until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.